Mi nombre eh, es Álvaro Rengifo y presido eh, la Fundación AMREF en España. Eh, el doctor Guitingi, Guitingi Getay, es el CEO, el consejero delegado de la organización a nivel mundial. Eh, yo siempre te quiero dos, dos palabras muy sentidas. La primera, agradecer eh, su presencia aquí a todos ustedes. Y en segundo lugar, eh, agradecer al premio, a la Fundación Princesa Asturias este reconocimiento tan importante y tan enorme que nos hace a, a, la, a las dos organizaciones, pero como muy bien subrayaba hace un, esta mañana el doctor Guitay, a, a todas las comunidades y a todas las personas que trabajan en la organización, a los más de eh, mil empleados que trabajan directamente en el terreno y a los más de 12 millones de personas que hemos formado en los últimos años trabajando para mejorar la salud en África. Yo, yo. Thank you very much and good morning, everyone. Um, I think Alvaro has said everything, and uh, mine is to say how honored I am to be in um, Asturias, and uh, for me to be here on behalf of all the people we work with, all the staff who work for Amref Health Africa, and all the communities who need our help every day for them to have a chance at a better life by having lasting health change. Uh, so we are really honored to be here on behalf of the community. So, and thank you for the honor that you've given us all the way from Africa. Thank you. Muchas gracias por sus palabras y enhorabuena por este galardón. Vamos a dar paso al turno de preguntas. Recuerden, por favor, indicar eh, su nombre y al medio al que representan. Mantengan apagados los teléfonos móviles, por favor. Pues comenzamos con el turno de preguntas. Primera pregunta. Sí, aquí. Buenos días, soy Milicima de Villa, soy periodista de la televisión autonómica asturiana. Eh, en los últimos años se ha constatado a nivel mundial que, que para trabajar en cooperación lo que se tiene que incidir es en, en identificar la vulnerabilidad y permanecer sobre el terreno. Ustedes llevan 60 años sobre el terreno del África subsahariana o del África negra, como, como se ven y como se identifican las millones de personas que viven en esa zona. Eh, el desafío es, eh, según ustedes han comentado, el desafío es precisamente el hecho de dar una cobertura sanitaria universal. Pero no sé si ustedes contemplan también que en un futuro ya presente hay otros eh, elementos a nivel mundial, como puede ser el cambio climático, que puede afectar a esas estructuras. No sé si ustedes están trabajando ya, pensando y previniendo lo que está por venir o que está llegando ya, que son los grandes movimientos de población con lo que ello conlleva, conflictividad, violencia, falta de recursos. Um. Thank you very much for that question, and I think it's uh, what you've identified, uh, key issues that result from uh, many of the factors that determine uh, the health of the people. Uh, the question you're asking has to do with, um, in many ways, sustainability of a healthy population. Now, some of the challenges we're dealing with in the African continent, other than climate change, is population growth. Now, you will know that probably Africa has the fastest um, population growth and the highest fertility rate per woman. And uh, what this means is that uh, we have a very big young population. In Africa, uh, more than 50% of the population is under 18 years. Uh, if you compare that with, um, uh, you know, with, with, with the Europe, where more than 50% is around 40 years and below, but in Africa is 18 years and below. What that means is that we have a very high dependency rate because population under 18 years is not productive. It is dependent. And uh, therefore, the consideration of how to take care of that population and start to build uh, sustainable employment and social protection for these people is important. Now, if we fail to do that, like many countries are failing to do, then you end up with um, resulting um, uh, challenges of what I call kind of, you know, uh, implosion, where 
communities or young people are uh, undergoing a lot of uh, suicide, for example. Others are migrating from their countries to other countries. We've seen the uh, big migration to Europe. And all this is a result of this high dependency rate without creating enough jobs. And um, uh, also, the other thing about um, this is that it also reflects uh, lack of universal access to health. Because uh, population explosion and population growth is also a result of poor access to comprehensive family planning uh, for women. It's also a response to uh, cultural norms that uh, result in early marriages, uh, where many girls get married when they are very, very young, and uh, therefore they uh, lack education. So at the end of the day, we are discussing the role of health in migration, the role of health in population growth, and this is why we we want to achieve universal health coverage for our people. And by universal health coverage, we are basically talking, ensuring that the people of Africa have access to adequate quality health care while they are being protected from financial catastrophe. Uh, health is a big cause of poverty uh, across the world, in Africa specifically. It is one of the biggest causes of poverty. And therefore, when you don't provide people health care, you end up with poverty. And then the poverty results in poor health care and becomes a toxic cycle. So the issue you are raising are, are macro issues. They are issues that uh, we deal with. But we believe that the starting point is investing in health for all. And it is the responsibility of governments to invest in health for all. And once we invest in health, then we get socioeconomic development, and then these other issues can then be dealt with. Siguiente pregunta, por favor. Hola, buenos días. Ana García, de Televisión Española. En relación un poco con la pregunta de mi compañera, pero desde el punto de vista sanitario, ustedes trabajan en una treintena de países. ¿Cuál es hoy su prioridad y, y, y qué tema sanitario es su prioridad? ¿Qué es lo que más le está preocupando? Um, uh, thank you for that. We work in uh, four countries in Africa, and I think uh, our priority is the community. So we have a community-centered approach to our work. Our vision as an organization is lasting health change uh, for the people who live in Africa and reside in Africa. And for us to create that lasting health change, it is therefore um, not specific on a particular disease. It is specific on the community uh, lifestyle and access to general health. So our biggest concern is actually what we call the social distance. Our biggest concern is the distance that exists between the people and the health system. Uh, you, you may know that many communities in Africa will live far from the health center. They live far from a health worker. And the difference is in terms of numbers of accessible health workers to population comparing Europe and Africa is very, very low. In Spain specifically, you may find maybe you have one doctor for every 250 people. In Africa, you have one doctor for every 10,000 people. So the people live far from the uh, health workers, half from, far from the facilities. And this may not only be geographic, it could also be cultural because of literacy because of the cultural beliefs that women need permission from their husbands to seek care. It may also be that uh, you know, girls are discriminated against, uh, therefore boys may be taken to care, but girls are not taken to care. So and it may also be financial. So this whole distance between the people and access to care is our biggest concern. And therefore, what we have done as an organization is trying to create community-based health systems where the people have health care next door. And to get healthcare next door means to create, to empower the community itself to identify their health challenges and to address them through structures we call community health uh, strategies or community health workers. Community health workers are people who are regular, identified by their communities. Then we train them to understand the different disease patterns of that particular community. Because again, as I said, Africa is diverse. Communities are diverse. And each community will have a different health issue. And therefore, it's important not to have a one size fits all approach and you have a community-based approach. So in some communities, you'll find that the biggest challenge is that the people have a very high burden of malaria. And therefore, we would work with the community to reduce the burden of malaria by making sure that we have 
cleared the bushes, we have reduced the incidence of um, mosquitoes, we have addressed the, you know, the, the, the infected children and treated them. But in another community, you might find that the biggest problem is um, diarrhea of children because of dirty water. So again, we work with them for that. So you find that we work on many disease areas, would range from HIV, TB, malaria, would also work on uh, maternal health, making sure that pregnant mothers access the care, the skilled care that they require, uh, child health, making sure children are vaccinated, uh, looking at the areas of water and sanitation, nutrition, where it is a problem for young children to access, nutritious diets for them to grow their brains and be able to go to school. We may also find many areas where cultural beliefs affect access to care. Um, you probably, between today and tomorrow, you'll meet one of our champions on something we call uh, ending female genital mutilation. In some communities, the outcomes for pregnancy and maternal health may be affected by uh, community practices like circumcising girls. And therefore, we work with the community to make sure that they stop the circumcision of girls so that the girls can get a better uh, outcome uh, of health. They can go to school, they can grow, and then they can uh, start their families when they are of good age. So our approach is actually closing the social distance, and we have, have a community-based, uh, a community-centered approach to healthcare, and depending on what actually affects the people. So that's what we've developed as a biggest tool for creating lasting health change for communities in Africa. Siguiente pregunta, por favor. Aquí. Sí, aquí. Perdón, eh, decía que estoy viendo estos días en la prensa española, en la prensa europea, titulares eh, aparentemente opuestos pero que conviven en relación a un mismo asunto, el VIH-Sida. Mientras estamos eh, leyendo titulares sobre avances decisivos en la, en la posible eh, curación del Sida o incluso la eliminación completa del VIH en algunos organismos, también vemos titulares como que África se muere de Sida. Estos titulares, insisto, conviven. Eh, ¿Se están dando pasos realmente mm, decisivos en África para contener esta pandemia o, o esa expansión del VIH-Sida sigue desangrando y matando a África como hacía hace 10 años, por ejemplo? Thank you very much. Uh, I hope the microphone is better now. I hope you can hear me. Um, uh, the issue of HIV is um, a significant issue. I think HIV still kills a huge number of people across Africa, uh, both children and adults. Uh, but what we know is that we have reduced the incidence of HIV uh, infection and also death from AIDS significantly by more than 50% in the last uh, 15 or so years. So we are making significant progress. I think there's still, um, you know, uh, the, the, the strategy has been to make sure originally that we educate the people about HIV so that they have the adequate information to protect and prevent themselves. So in the, you know, uh, in the early days of HIV, we did a lot of campaigns on making sure that uh, we advise people on abstention, we advise people on uh, you know, uh, reducing number of uh, sexual partners and also advising people to use uh, protection, uh, condoms. Uh, but then that strategy has also evolved to what we call the 90-90-90 now, where we work with UN AIDS and other agencies to make sure that 90% of the people in every country or every community know their HIV status and that out of these 90% who know the HIV status, if there are any who are positive, 90% of them are on treatment, and that if they're on treatment, they're actually on adequate treatment that reduces their, uh, the effect of the virus on them. This strategy has resulted in reduced infection rates significantly. Uh, the challenge we're having now is um, the, the, the challenge of um, uh, mother-to-child transmission. So, uh, you know, women who are infected earlier and they, are, they have a likelihood of transmitting the virus to their children, but this is also being addressed uh, through what we call stopping mother-to-child transmission through support of governments, through support of uh, the Global Fund, working with communities to make sure 
that uh, mothers have access to treatment so that they are also advised on how to, you know, if a mother is positive, how, uh, what practice of breastfeeding should they follow, how should they feed their children, and uh, also ensuring their adequate treatment, and also putting young neonates after birth on treatment that is protects them against uh, infection. Some of the pockets that um, uh, we are obviously uh, concerned about is young people. Young people who, uh, because of um, the, the numbers of, of, of youth, and also the fact that the prevention message has kind of uh, gone down a bit, we are now having increased infection rates for young people between 15 and 24 years. And in some countries now, all new cases of HIV infection are in between 15 and 24 years. And this is a concern that now we are addressing, and therefore the efforts that were there to create awareness on prevention are coming back uh, globally, and uh, we are working together with the different agencies and the governments to make sure that this message is, uh, is, is out. Uh, but also um, a lot of efforts to make sure that um, uh, you know that, that people are aware in the schools, in the communities, and also make sure that all the people who have HIV have access to treatment. I think the challenge we have is that not everyone uh, you know, who has HIV has access to medication, and this is a big issue of financing, which we are dealing with. Uh, and obviously, we continue to ask the global community, uh, bilateral partners and multilateral partners, to continue to invest heavily in making sure that every child, who is po every person who is positive has access to antiretrovirals. So it is a diminishing epidemic, and we continue to work to make sure that uh, it will have an AIDS-free generation. Yeah. pregunta. Buenos días. Soy Cristina Huerta de Onda Cero. Eh, yo quisiera saber eh, qué índice de natalidad tienen las mujeres en, en África, a qué edad empiezan a tener hijos y qué media de hijos tienen. ¿Está usted en la región con la situación de natalidad más opuesta a su eh, contexto habitual? Nosotros tenemos un índice de envejecimiento altísimo con una natalidad bajísima. Quisiera saber un poco ese contrapunto que hay en África. Y por otra parte… Una segunda pregunta. Eh, bueno, recuerdos de cuando iniciaron ustedes eh, la formación de sanitarios en, en África. ¿Cómo fue esa, esa introducción? Porque tuvo que chocar mucho con la cultura, con chamanismo. ¿Cómo, ¿Cómo fueron esos inicios de la formación de sanitarios de la población? Um, to answer your first question is uh, to say that the, the, you know, the um, population growth in Africa is around 2%, so it's, uh, it's actually ranging between 2 and 2.5%. And, 2 .5%. and the, uh, what we call the average number of children per uh, woman or productive age would be about 4.7 in some countries. In some countries like Nigeria, it's 6 and above uh, per woman, so it's really high. Um, but we are seeing continuous decline of this number. So uh, I would say what I'm talking about, 4, 4.5, would have been 6.5 before. So we are seeing continuous declines. But we have countries of concern, Uganda, Nigeria. Um, we have concerns in these countries. Um, in terms of when uh, you know, young girls start to get married, we know that we have a big problem with teenage pregnancy. And uh, this teenage pregnancy is obviously, as I said earlier, affected by cultures. Cultures like we experience in some communities, like the Maasai community, where they circumcise girls at the age of nine. And when they're circumcised, they are moved from being a girl to a woman. And therefore, they are, they are ready for marriage. And therefore, we see a lot of, um, uh, actually, we say one, one in five girls is in danger of getting married under 18 in Africa and 18 years. So we have a big problem of teenage pregnancy, which is, um, which is what results in this um, kind of inverted uh, uh, population pyramid, where here you have <coughs> people you know, uh, who are much older. And in Africa, we have uh, a very big uh, bottom population. This also affects our mortality statistics. If you look at uh, death rate in Africa, I would say that 50%, almost 50% of the deaths are under five years. 
Whereas when you look at across Europe, more than 80% of the deaths are above uh, 60 years, meaning it's a disease of old age. But because of this population growth and rapid expansion, we have a lot of deaths of neonates, especially deaths in the first month. Actually, 50% of those deaths under five years would be within the first month, which speaks to um, the need to improve maternal outcomes, to monitor you know, mothers when they are pregnant, to make sure that when babies are born, we have immediate care at that point, which speaks to being able to access skilled delivery, access skilled health workers, access medicines, clean environment. Water is a big determinant of outcomes of delivery because some mothers will deliver in a place where there is no clean water, and therefore the baby will end up getting contaminated and die of something you call sepsis. So all these things are connected, clean water, clean environment, access to health workers. So um, this is what I would say, that actually, uh, you know, the, 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 we need to work on, number one, education is a big area of investment because if you don't educate young girls, then there's a high likelihood that they're going to get married early and end up with teenage pregnancy. So investment in education is a big, big thing, especially for girls. Uh, the next thing is obviously to make sure that they have access to comprehensive reproductive services, that they can make choice, that they are aware of their choices. Uh, and this is also an area we need to work with the church and the communities to agree that we can discuss comprehensive sexuality in their communities without them seeing that as uh, an interference of their cultural values. Um, uh, and that's, a, that's an issue. Uh, you know, that brings me to the issue you've talked about, about training of health workers. Traditionally, people have depended, uh, depended uh, heavily on uh, traditional bath attendants and uh, traditional healers. And uh, those people have been significant in improving people's lives and people's confidence. Because again, seeking health is also an issue of trust. People want to seek health from somebody they trust. And this is also what I talked about earlier, the social distance. That because health is so personal, People don't want to go to someone they don't know. And they consider a doctor as someone they don't know. So they prefer to go to somebody who is local, who they can discuss openly their issue. And this is why the issue of traditional healers and birth attendants has persisted in Africa for so long. So for, for organizations like AMREF, we recognize that it's not, it's not a single solution that when you provide a doctor or a nurse, that people will abandon the local healer, or that when you provide a midwife, the women will abandon the traditional birth attendants. It doesn't work like that. It's not a mathematical equation. It is an issue of also working with the traditional birth attendants, the traditional healers, and converting their attitudes so that they continue working in the community, but their actions are different. Their actions now are converted into referral to hospital, consulting health workers, rather than saying, please leave a traditional birth attendance if they are bad and therefore use a, a midwife. You can't do that because these people are heavily trusted by communities. So we are working to transition them from their traditional practices to more modern practices, but still working with them and converting them into birth assistants rather than birth attendants. So this is the, uh, the, the, the kind of approach we are making, and we found very positive results from it. Tenemos tiempo para una última pregunta. Eh, hasta este mes de mayo, eh, AMREF en España era bastante desconocida, por no decir una gran desconocida. Sin embargo, llevan 20 años trabajando o recaudando fondos desde aquí. A mí me gustaría saber cuál, cuántos donantes hay en España, cuánto dinero se aporta a los proyectos de África y cómo es el perfil del donante español. Muchas gracias. Eh, eh, España, efectivamente, llevamos, la fundación lleva funcionando desde el año 97, efectivamente, 21 años, un poco más. Y eh, en todos estos años hemos pasado una etapa muy importante que a partir del año 2008-2009, donde prácticamente el 90% de los fondos que enviábamos a los proyectos que definía eh, en Nairobi y las diferentes sedes africanas era provenía de fondos públicos, fundamentalmente de la Agencia Española de Cooperación, pero también de gobiernos regionales y de algunos eh, eh, gobiernos locales. ¿no? Pedíamos que el 90, 90, prácticamente el 90% venía de, 
de fondos públicos. A partir de la crisis, 2008-2010, eh, digamos que, como muy bien saben, pues, eh, España ha pasado de tener alrededor de casi 2.000 millones de euros de cooperación internacional a menos de 200, 300. Esa reducción de prácticamente a una décima parte de su pues ha sido también a, a afectado enormemente a nuestra situación. Y de tener 4 o 5 millones de euros en proyectos al año, estamos ahora entre 1 y 1,5 y medio y algunos hemos llegado a 1,8. Estamos prácticamente en una quinta parte, no una décima, hemos sabido sortear mejor que otros esta crisis, digamos, de, de, de financiera para la cooperación internacional. Probablemente por lo que hemos escuchado, que ha sido creo que muy interesante lo que ha dicho el doctor Guitay, el doctor Kitiñi Dictay, sobre cómo somos una ONG, no solo la más importante en África, sino muy eficaz y muy arraigada en las comunidades y muy arraigada en de qué manera, entendiendo la cultura africana, somos capaces de ejecutar proyectos de manera eficaz. Eso nos ha permitido tener esos primeros 10 o 12 años mucho prestigio en todas las, eh, digamos, eh, autoridades nacionales, regionales o locales, y nos ha permitido mantenernos pues, por encima de la media. O sea, hemos estado, bueno, como digo, reducido a una quinta parte. Hemos también cambiado el perfil de tener 90%, 80-90% de financiación pública a tener prácticamente 50-50, hoy estamos casi con la mitad, y por tanto, y nuestro objetivo sería pues, probablemente conseguir una financiación eh, estable digamos, del entorno de los dos millones, pero en el cual 80% sea privado y 20% sea público. Y cuando la parte pública crezca, pues mejor que crezca, y, pero sin que sea nuestra, eh, digamos, nuestra base fundamental o el pilar más importante de nuestra financiación. Hoy tenemos un poco menos de 300 miembros, pero tenemos como un, una docena de empresas que también nos ayudan, eh, como socios, digamos, de, de empresas hacia, hacia AMREF, y por tanto somos, como bien apuntado, una ONG de desarrollo o una fundación dedicada a la cooperación en África muy poco conocida. Es verdad y es, un, es el regalo más importante que hemos recibido de este premio, aparte del premio en sí, y, y estar aquí con ustedes, el, que, el reconocimiento que estamos teniendo estos últimos meses y que estamos seguros que esta semana va a tener una, un momento de, de enorme proyección. ¿no? Y ese es un poco ahora nuestro reto, es aquí la directora general, nuestro reto en España, en África. En África son mucho más conocidos y trabajan con un montón de todas las agencias de Naciones Unidas. Pero nosotros que estamos en una situación mucho más eh, delicada y mucho más desconocida, pues nuestro reto es aprovechar este momento tan importante, esta magnífica oportunidad para darnos a conocer. Y eh, un poco nuestra idea sería conseguir, pues en Europa somos siete países que, eh, que los que hay siete fundaciones que trabajan con AMREF en Mundial, la media de sus miembros, pues eh, tenemos desde 70.000 en los Países Bajos a 20.000 en Italia, 15 o 20.000 en el Reino Unido, pues en España estamos 300, pues la idea es que otros nos acerquemos, si no a la media, que está en torno a los 10.000, por lo menos a una cifra que se acerque a 2.000, 2.000 miembros en los próximos meses, ¿no? Eso sería un poco nuestra, y eso nos permitiría, de alguna forma, pues asegurar la, eh, la continuidad de nuestros eh, apoyos a, a los proyectos africanos. Pero ese ha sido un poco el perfil y hoy, efectivamente, estamos con un reto muy grande de aprovechar al máximo este magnífico regalo.